All right, we are back. What's up, everybody? Drew here, thatanxietyguy.com. With me as always, Hello again. Billy from Anxiety United in the sunny United Kingdom. It's, it's not sunny, but it's, it's sunny. definitely the United Kingdom. All right. Well, that and, that's 50%. That's not bad. Yeah, yeah, we're halfway there. I'd go to Vegas with those odds. <laughs> not the moment, perhaps. But yeah. So uh, we are up to episode 17 in our series here. We are. Very impressive track record you and I have. Yeah, yeah, this is good. <laughs> Every week. Um, we had a um, a comment on Billy's channel, I, I believe. Did you get this on Facebook, or where did you get this what we're going to talk about today? My, my stuff. My mind's gone completely blank. It was on Facebook. <laughs> it was on Facebook, yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> That's all right. It's, uh, the, the, the majority, or, well, not the majority, but a lot of the comments that I get are about being able to relate to the things that I say yeah. because obviously I'm in the midst of all this crap myself and I think a lot of people would like to hear your side of things you know when although it's not really helpful for you no, let's go I don't mind let's go all. down that trail okay how did Drew used to feel so we're gonna you know, go down memory lane with Drew today yeah, yeah. <laughs> I don't really mind. It's okay. It's not that it's not helpful or unhelpful or anything. I don't mind talking about that stuff. I actually, well, I get asked that a lot too. Well, this is it. Did, I think did, you, a, did you feel this? Did you feel that? I think people like to be able to relate to the, you know, whether it helps them or not. It probably does, I guess, knowing that they're not the only person because that's how often you feel, that you're the only person that feels that sensation or experiences anxiety in that circumstance. So maybe, you know, the more we talk about maybe our experiences hopefully it can put a few of their worries to bed i guess that would be the key yeah well, i think that's fair and i'm perfectly happy to share that stuff nothing is a secret so that's fine yeah so all right people have asked you know what was my what was my problem back then what's your problem dude and mm -hmm. um you know what did i have to deal with did i have to deal with the same things that they did i get asked that like oh i have problems sleeping did you have that problem that sort of stuff so I mean, I'll give you how about the sixty-second version of the whole story, and then we can go into like specifics. Let's do it. I think the let me just put out the yeah. the reason for this is because people probably don't understand that you used to be in the same boat that I'm in, that I've been in, you know, and that many other people are because they see you now and yeah. they see that you're thriving. You know, you're successful business better at many things in life and people don't actually realize that you were as bad as we the collective us you Absolutely. know because they don't they don't believe that it's possible to get to your position so here's the proof drew is about to share <laughs> go Clock. Okay, go. Ready, go. <laughs> Clock is ticking. So, all right, I'll give you the, the, the quick Reader's Digest version. I had my very first panic attack, which came, like, out of the blue. You know, we say it's totally out of the blue. Yeah. It was, like, 1986. I was, it was my sophomore year in college, so I'm dating myself. If you guys can do math, now you know how old I am. Um, <clears throat> and I, I was at home. It was during spring break. I was in the house that I grew up in. I was in my bedroom like that I had been in for thousands and thousands of nights and suddenly it hit me. I had that like that derealization, depersonalization, mm -hmm. my heart was racing, blah, blah, blah. You know, everybody knows what a panic attack feels like. And the first time it ever hit me was then. Everything was going awesome in my life. In fact, I had a 4.0 grade point average that semester. So who the hell knows why it picked then to come out, but it did. So I had my first panic attack. It was probably one of the most terrifying experiences in my whole life. I'll never forget it till the day I die. I kind of wrote it through the night and I immediately went, started going down that spiral, you know, where, mm -hmm. uh oh, is this going to happen to me again? Yeah, yeah. So we've talked about the difference between people who have panic attacks and the people who have panic disorder. Like almost immediately I began to like worry and focus on, is this going to happen again? I don't want that to yeah. happen again because it was freaking horrible. So I went through a couple of very, uh, very difficult months. I w went back up to school. And I really struggled. I finished the semester, but I was having panic attacks often. I was starting to worry about having them all the time. Came home, went to work that summer, had a summer job. And I remember going to see, I worked for a company that actually had a doctor and a nurse like on staff. Mm -hmm. And I remember one day uh, I was just feeling terribly and I, I had sort of been friendly with the nurse because they were in the building that I was in and, and I would see her and we'd say hello to each other. And, blah, blah. and I remember mentioning to her like I'm having this issue and, and she was great. I don't remember her name, but she actually pointed me to a, a local psychologist, not a psychiatrist. 
And she said, you should go talk to this guy. His name was Dr. Friedberg. And Dr. Friedberg, if you're still alive, thank you. <laughs> mm. So I went to go see this guy. I had two sessions with him. He handed me the Claire Weeks book, Hope and Help right. for Your Nerves. Cool. And, and he said, this is, you know, read this. And I did. And I'm not kidding you. I read the whole book in probably six or eight hours because it's a small book, you know. Yeah, yeah. And I, I literally, I, you know, I took the advice to heart right away. And the next time I started having a panic attack, I'll never forget, it was in my mother's car. And I did exactly what she said to do. And it, it went away in five or six minutes. Mm -hmm. And it was like, oh, oh, like this big revelation. And I quickly got back on my feet. And I literally did not have another panic attack for probably 10 years. And then no, mm -hmm. no shit. I know yeah. people think that that sounds crazy, but that was actually true. As soon as I read the book and I said, oh, that's what this is, I knew what it mm. was. Yeah, yeah. And I knew what to do. I was able to do it. And I guess I hadn't gone a far, down far enough the negative road yet. It was only been six, or, six months or so for me. Mm. But I will tell you that before I read that book and before I kind of righted the ship again, I was absolutely on a downward spiral. You know, I was constantly obsessed with how I was feeling. I was constantly taking my pulse. I was constantly mm -hmm. worried about being dizzy. I was constantly worried about getting in the car and driving. That was always a problem for me. Yeah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, my world was starting to shrink, as can happen. And then luckily, I just, by chance, I happened to read the book. It helped me very much, and I, and I was good for about 10 years. And then mm -hmm. fast forward to about 1996, um, I had started – like my first internet based business and things were going really well. We were getting a ton of customers. It was like the dot com boom and they came back again for whatever reason. The panic came back yeah. again and I was not really for whatever reason. I wasn't really able to apply all the Dr. Week stuff and I just went into that downward spiral and I got to the point where I remember very clearly probably the lowest point <clears throat> just being literally like frozen in fear in my bathroom of the house I was living at at the time. Yeah. Could move, didn't want to leave the bathroom. It was awful. It was awful. I was, I was also depressed. I was very clinically depressed at the time, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> it was at that point I was, you know, I went to see a couple of doctors, and my my GP at the time sat me in his office and gave me the, you have a chemical imbalance speech. Yep. And he gave me Paxil, which here in the U.S. Paxil, I think Cerizat, Cerizat in the U in the U.K. I'm not sure. But sure. um, he gave me a prescription for Paxil. He gave me the old, if you were diabetic, you would take insulin speech. And I started yeah, taking yeah. it. Yep. And sure enough, it did work. And we'll talk about that some other day. But it worked mm -hmm. within about two weeks. Suddenly, I felt like it was the greatest thing in the history of mankind. Like, because I would start to feel panic and then it would short circuit. And my depression list lifted and I became like a real person again. Yeah. Or, or at least I thought I did. And I took that medication for a good nine years. <clears throat> and I gained 100 pounds. And I was completely detached from my family and my business and I almost lost the business and my house and it was I was just a walking zombie I didn't have panic or depression but I didn't have anything yeah. I made horrific decisions I was unhealthy I was like living as an island it was not a good situation my kids one day I'll tell that story my kids actually shook me out of that and I decided I need to stop taking this medication and around that time is when I I, that's you and I didn't meet then. That was two thousand five. I think it was just after. Yeah. It was after it was that. A few years after. Yeah. It was so I, I decided that I didn't want to take the medication anymore because I couldn't keep going the way I was going. I was literally, you know, headed for complete and utter disaster. So I stopped taking the medication. I struggled for a good year with readapt. I'll call it readaptation. Pharmaceutical companies don't like the word withdrawal, but unfortunately, I was one yeah. of those thirty thirty five percent of the people who experienced that. It was very mm. bad. That was a different animal, I think, because it was probably more chemical in nature than anything else. There was nothing I could do to stop it except wait for time to pass. Yeah. And I lived just a nightmare of constant crippling panic and anxiety and depression and a roller coaster up and down and obsessive, irrational, overpowering thoughts 24-7, couldn't sleep. I am telling you, if you feel like you are a mess... I absolutely know because I was a complete and utter mess, like fetal position in tears. I'm not ashamed to admit that. It was it was horrific. Mm -hmm. It just beat me right to the ground. But I, I kind of stuck through it. I got out of that. And, um, you know, things were going fairly well. I was a little tenuous. And then you and I met probably around 2008, and I started sliding backwards again. My fault. <laughs> No, not your fault at all. When I found you on YouTube, it was because I was looking for other people. Like we had gotten to that point where, oh, yeah. there, there is a YouTube and I can go and look to see if anybody has made videos about that. And I remember the first guy that I found was 
a guy by the name of JP. Uh, he's, I don't think his channel is still there. JP mm. of Diamonds. He was from Sweden. Um, right. And he made a long series of videos just sitting at his desk with his desk lamp on him talking about his, his panic and anxiety situation. Mm-hmm. It was awesome. And then I found you and Sarah and a few other people, Chris in Ohio. Yeah. But in those days, <clears throat> I, I was in that – I had slid backward again. And my issue then wasn't so much depression, although it was – it was definitely anxiety and an agoraphobia was setting in quickly mm. Mm. because again, now I was experiencing it without that sort of chemical shield in front of me for the first yeah. time. Yeah. And I, and I would not go back on the medication no matter what I would not do it. I swore that I would, I would never ever do that again and I mm. won't. So I had to deal with it just sort of naturally and it absolutely kicked my ass for a good six months or more. When you and I first met, I was in a bad, bad spot. You, you've seen the old videos. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I was, people ask, did you ever have problems sleeping? Yes. I, I, I would fall asleep. I'm a, I'm a night owl anyway. I don't sleep a whole lot. But I would fall asleep at midnight and then wake up again at 3 o'clock in the morning and not be able to go back to sleep. Mm. I literally resorted to like white noise app on my phone with headphones and a, like a, you know, an eye, a sleep mask to keep the light mm-hmm. out. I tried all that. I would wake up in the morning and just immediately my stomach would be in a knot. The minute I opened my eyes, the anxiety mm-hmm. would automatically kick in. I wouldn't want to get out of bed. I wouldn't want to go to work. I wouldn't want to leave the house. I wouldn't want to get in the car. It was getting harder and harder to do all of those things. I couldn't drive my daughter to her horseback riding lessons. I didn't want to go literally a 30-second drive from my house. There's a little dairy store. I wouldn't want to go there and buy eggs for the family. It, it was horrible. I couldn't be home. I didn't want to be home alone. I didn't want to be alone. So monophobia comes along with agoraphobia mm-hmm. very often. I don't know if anybody's ever experienced that, but it's normal. I would if you're, imagine if so. you're agoraphobic, there's a really good chance that you also are terrified to be alone. You need to always have somebody with you. Mm-hmm. And I know I'm just rambling here, but <clears throat> I just, I had all of those things. I had always checking my pulse, always worried about, I couldn't feel like I couldn't breathe all the time. Like, again, the the racing thoughts came back. The obsessive thinking came back. All of those things came back. And I cannot tell you how crappy it was. Not to tell you. I mean, you guys know because you're going through it. You know, I, I've, I own my own business. I couldn't go. And you know this because you saw the videos. It was a challenge yeah. for me to go to my own office, which was literally like an eight-minute drive from home. I, I isolated myself. It was bad. It was very bad. Um I mean, I could think of all the symptoms. I had them all. I had them all, all the time. Well, that's it. We, we used to discuss, you know, we'd, we'd obviously go out and do something and we'd talk about exactly how it felt. And yeah. Pretty much, if anybody's ever watched any of my exposure videos, that's exactly how you used to feel, isn't it? Yes, it was. Exactly, yeah, exactly the same. I had my little orange point-and-shoot camera back then. Yeah. And I would take that everywhere. And, and I was, I have to tell you, in my... Journey and, and I was asked. I went live on Facebook just to play with my new camera a couple of weeks ago, and somebody um, popped in who I've known for many years too. And she said, "Well, you know, what did you start doing different? What did you start doing different?" It just I knew what I had to do. I mean, that the, the Claire Weeks thing from many many years ago, nineteen eighty six, eighty seven, mm-hmm. taught me the foundation. I, I do have a background in behavioral psychology. That was my minor uh, as an undergrad. And I've just always been into that sort of stuff. So I, I always knew in my heart what I had to do. And it was just a matter of being cornered to the point mm. where it's like, I either have to change this or I don't know what's going I'm going to lose everything. You know, I can't. Yeah. I'm, I'm letting down my family. I'm letting down my kids. I, you know, canceling trips, not seeing friends. Like, I, you know, couldn't go to lunch with a friend, for God's sake. It was it was mm. horrible. Living in constant anticipa- anticipation of like, is somebody going to ask me to leave the house? Is somebody going to ask me to do something? Do I have to go anywhere? Do I have to drive anywhere? Uh, you can probably relate to these things. Absolutely, yeah. Right? Yeah. Like, and so I, I, abs- I was there. I know all of these things. So when somebody says to me, you know, I, I have to, hey, I get this all the time. Hey, Drew, I have, to, I have to go to a wedding. You know, I have a hard time going to the supermarket and I have to go mm-hmm. to a wedding in another state next week. What do I do? Like, that was me. You know, that was that was me too. Yeah, so, yeah. I, I'm probably glossing over a lot of details. Feel free to ask questions on behalf of everybody else. Know, but... should, people probably, I don't know whether it's a maybe it's a jealousy thing where because I feel like envious of your situation now. But you know, 
it's not because you were lucky that you managed to break free of it. It's because you put in the hard work. That's the and everybody that's sitting here watching, thinking he's a lucky sod. Like, well, look at him now. It's got nothing to do with luck. I'm going to say that there's probably an element of luck, and I will tell you where luck comes in. Or I don't know what. Call it whatever you want. Mm. Luck comes in because I found people like you and Chris and Sarah and Emma, and I'm trying to mm-hmm. think. Seth, um, who's in Australia? I can't think of the names right now. But, um, you know, that group that grew into Panic Station when we had Panic mm-hmm. Station, um, yeah. which was, you know, those were good people. Those were awesome people. Mm-hmm. Natalie here on Long Island. Um, yeah. And that was the luck part in a way. Like I mm-hmm. and I was afforded I suppose, the opportunity. Yeah. yeah, you know, and, and I and I will never underestimate people ask me sometimes, well, why you do this? You know, you can make money on this podcast or whatever. And I'm like, I feel like I owe it because like you guys were there and and I think the biggest difference so look, uh, let me just say this. You could pick a symptom that you've had, I've probably had it. Mm-hmm. You, you could mm-hmm. pick a sensation that you had, I've probably felt it. You could pick a fear that you have, I've probably been afraid of that. I was afraid to be the first person to take a drink out of, of the milk carton in case yeah. it had been poisoned. Mm-hmm. Literally. And that was an obsessive thought. I, I couldn't watch the news. I couldn't read a newspaper. I was obsessed with death and dying. I had intrusive thoughts all the time. Pick a symptom, I have lived it. No doubt about that. But... In the end, it wasn't so much, yeah, I put in the hard work, but I also was surrounded by people who were cheering me on in a yeah, way. Yeah, we talked about that a lot. Right? Yeah, yeah. And I cannot underestimate the value of that. Like, it's it's one thing to know, like, well, I have to do this. It's another thing to know, well, I'm going to go do this. And I know Billy's doing it right now. And I know Sarah was doing it right now. I know Emma's doing it right now. And these are people that I will forever be indebted to. Mm-hmm. Maybe Emma, Emma's not. I don't know if Emma's watching this or not. But if Emma, maybe not know the impact that she had on my life. So yeah, surra- yeah. surrounding yourself with people who are going through the same thing is good. But it wasn't a group that was just commiserating. Chris in Ohio, who I'm still Facebook friends with, we yeah, interact yeah. now and then. That guy, I'm never going to be able to repay him for yeah. for showing me his struggle and getting out there and, mm-hmm. and challenging it and doing what he needed to do, and it would inspire me to do it too. So it's, it's odd, like there's like the two people you've just mentioned, Chris and Emma. Emma they yeah. both seem to be thriving now, right. as are you. But then there's people like myself, and I know that Sarah still struggles with her stuff. So like, what it, there must be something that either we didn't pick up on, or there's something that just didn't click for us, or were we not putting enough effort in, or what? I know that's the million dollar question. It is like, a million what dollar is question. It, what did we miss? What What did we miss? And I think it's always the million dollar question. I, I can't answer mm. that question either. But I, I think if I look at that group too, I would think um, I'm sort of thinking as I go here. It's, this is a good, good. This is actually helpful for me to go through. I think we let's just pause for a second and yeah. just say thank you for sharing that because that was like, oh, I think that's going to help people massively to understand that you you've been there, you've been through it. So the stuff that you're saying is not from a textbook. This isn't something that you've learned. No, this is something that you've lived. And that's why yes. you're the right man to tell us well, you what you freaking do. I mean, I'm just going to share my experiences. I'm not going to say I'm right or wrong for anything in particular. But, yeah, I, I did live it. I lived it several times. And it, mm. and, and I, if it helps, like it, it didn't – yes, the first time was a little weird. I read a book and didn't have another panic attack. Like that's weird. I yeah, will yeah. admit that's an anomaly. But it wasn't like I – you know, well, yeah, I had a few panic attacks for a few months and I figured out what to do and I was all better. Literally mm. from 1986 – but through 1996 through 19 through 2010, and we're yeah. talking about 12 to 14 years where I was either medicated and having a horrible time of that, or mm-hmm. or dealing with anxiety, depression, agoraphobia, all of those things. It was a big chunk of my adult life has mm. been spent putting a lot of time and effort into these issues. So it took time, and I failed a bunch of times until I mm. figured it out and started to get it right. Mm. But. Um, I will never forget. I you know, I know you've seen the video. I'm sure you've forgotten. It's nothing to you. I have them, and I have several people who've asked, do you have videos like Billy's? And yeah. I do. I, I have to find them. They're somewhere on a hard drive, either here or at my house. And one day I will find a few, and I'll post them. There was one night that I did actually have to go at night back to my data center where I had a racks and racks full of equipment because that's the business that I'm in, or at least mm-hmm. wasn't at the time. And there was a server down, and I could have called somebody else who worked for me to go do it, but that person would have had to drive driven 35 minutes. I was seven minutes away. Yeah. 
And I remember I was sitting at my desk at my house when it happened, and I was actually watching one of Chris's videos. Mm -hmm. And I don't remember what he had done. He was out for a walk, whatever it was. And he used to walk down this rural part of Ohio. Okay, you remember these videos? Remember. He would walk down just, this like endless country road. road. Like there was nothing yeah. there. It was very unnerving to watch that. There's no mm -hmm. help. There's no people. There's no nothing. Mm -hmm. And I remember watching him do it. And he would talk into the camera like, like we would do it back in those days. And mm -hmm. I was watching Chris as the alert came in that this needed to be done. And my first instinct was to say, all right, let me get, let me call so-and-so. He's on call. I'm going to have him do it. As Chris's video was playing on my screen and it dawned on me like this, this mofo is out there walking down this crazy deserted country road. Surely I can do this. Yeah. And I took, but I took water and I took my Altoid mints and I took my camera and it was mm -hmm. pitch black. You couldn't see what the hell I was filming. You couldn't see me, yeah. but it was a crutch and I took the camera in and I remember thinking like I'm a quarter of the way there. I'm halfway there. I'm three quarters of the way there. Seven minute drive, dude. Like, and yeah. I had to break it down. I stopped halfway in the parking lot of a diner. I'm like, all right, I'm halfway there. And I remember filming that, talking mm -hmm. to nobody in particular, but just talking to the camera. I'm three quarters away. I'm there. I remember thinking, okay, great. I went in the building shaking, sweating. I was, I was a mess. And then mm -hmm. there was that thing where it's like, I'm going to hit the button on the server. Please, God, let it boot correctly. Because if it doesn't, I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. Just, oh, it was, it was a harrowing, harrowing experience. And I didn't do that right. I white knuckled through the whole thing. Yeah, so yeah. that was wrong. What I did was not correct there. And I remember sitting and waiting. And I, if I watched that video back, I was breathing like I was in a marathon. And, yeah. you know, just and the, my eyes were like shh, just the fear in my eyes, mm -hmm. waiting, waiting, waiting. And bam, it came up. And I'm like, good. And it, it, the minute the login screen appeared, I knew I was good. The server was back online. I remember, Scope. yes, hitting the lights and just <laughs> hightailing out of that place, getting in my car, head home. And as soon as I started driving home, suddenly – you know, I felt like, you know, like Thor, like a freaking yeah. superhero. Yeah, yeah. And I remember thinking that night, like, uh -huh, you know, I want this feeling more. Yeah. And I did it wrong, but I got through it. And that is that was the night that I remember it started like, I mm -hmm. OK, this is this is stupid. Now I have to do this. So but you yeah. were inspired by a video. That's the I was inspired by Chris. Yeah, there's one, one of mine that I always like that was one of my favorites that I ever did was when I was sitting in the car and I tried to walk like hundred yards down. I was in the town outside the bowling alley. Yeah. yeah. I tried to walk like hundred yards and then the next, the camera cut and I was back in the car smoking a cigarette, just yep. freaking. Yep. And then I went and parked somewhere else and just waited until I felt the urge to go and do it. Do you remember I, that? I remember very and, clearly. And then I walked like to the edge of town on my own and I just felt like it was crazy. The, there was a, a tennis court and a parking that's right. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah. video is still on. It's one of my most popular old exposure ones. I'm sitting in the car in a red coat. Yes. And it's just like, I'm just waiting for this moment when I've got the confidence to just, Yep. I think I, I say, I remember, fuck it. Yes, and then I just, that's uh, exactly right. And you just opened the car door and went. And yeah, I, yeah. And I remember watching that. I literally remember like, yeah, you're like, yes, you know, like literally like you're watching a movie and you're like Rocky against Apollo Come Creed. Come on. Come on, damn it. And I just, I remember the feeling you had getting back in the car. And I remember yeah, you literally saying, you better praise the, me. Yes, I remember that looking into the camera. You best be praising me for this. <laughs> it, but the feeling was, I remember, I could see it in your face being so mm. happy. Mm. Uh, and I remember another time where you had gone. It's just so silly now we're just reminiscing about stuff. But maybe, maybe it'll help people. I don't know. You had to go to Birmingham. You drove. Yes. You drove to the the the, the Birmingham shop, the right, club shop, right, 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 yeah, yeah. to the to the pitch, right. So I remember going. I remember watching that too, and just the you know you were just being. You were so happy having had done it. Didn't you? You remade the video with a soundtrack. Oh, over, I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Oh, it got take it got taken down too because I used. I used some. So I remember a song I used, and uh, YouTube didn't like that copyright issue, uh, but. Dear. Uh, yeah, it was pretty I funny. Went, I went back there not too long ago in a video. I went back to the blues thing, got yeah. out of the car and took a thumbnail picture out there, yeah. Was it nearly as hard as it was then? I'm thinking it's not. I'm not saying it was it's no, easy, but... Yeah, no, it was nowhere near as hard, but I think the anticipation was probably the same. But I think that's the problem that I have now. It's that, like, perhaps because I've got so many negative memories that the anticipation of doing anything, like I think about, even just going to my local shop, Right. And I don't really have a problem with doing it, and I go and do it. But like, if I sit here and think about it, I could talk myself out of it very, very easily. Yeah. But if you don't think about it, I'm, I'm guessing you're able to do a whole lot. You're you're not the same person now that you were 
it's weird because I feel like I'm completely restricted. Like yeah. I, I literally, I haven't been in a supermarket. Like I went in a big shop the other week, but right. I haven't been in a supermarket for, I would say, over a year, hmm. probably. And I haven't been to watch my daughter dance for a couple of years. The last time I went, I had a panic attack in the theater. Yeah. And because they wouldn't, because while people are dancing, like the kids are on the stage doing their thing, they won't let people out. Yep. So this was mid dance. I was having a panic attack, and they wouldn't open the door for me. So it was like, shit. Yeah, yeah. Well, so that's just, a bad experience then. But it was good in a way because it meant that I had to just sit there and ride it out, which I did. And by the time the kid had finished dancing and the door was open, right, the, the moment had sort of passed anyway. So it was probably a good thing that they didn't let me out. I think sometimes if you really think about that, like if I think about my progress, there were things that I didn't do also for a very long time. Mm. But it kind of got to the point where it just became a habit to not do them. I as think a, that's where I'm at. Yeah. As, right. As opposed to like, oh, I'm terrified to do this. I don't want to do this. It just became like a habit. Like, oh, I don't do that. Mm. And yet I remember thinking at one yeah. point, like, um, you know, I went to the shopping mall, which is from my house. It's maybe a 10 minute ride. So it's a fairly large mall. Mm. And I hadn't been in there alone for a really long time. And I remember thinking one night, it was like a Friday night, like, wait, I don't, I don't go there. Why don't I go there? And, mm. and I went, and it was, there was anxiety because I had just hadn't done it in so long. Yeah. yeah. Um, but I, I think sometimes you get to the point where it's like, well, it's just a habit that I'm not doing these things. Mm. It's, it's mm. not because I feel like I can't or I won't. It's just I it's haven't, just a, I haven't not, for yeah. so long. Right. It's not even a decision you make, is it? You go, like, I, I take my wife to the shop, to the supermarket, and it, like she just gets out of the car, she goes in, and it's not even are you coming in? No, it's not. There's no. I'm not even having that debate with myself. Oh, right. I'm going to give it a try because I'm just not. But incidentally, that it was weird the other day. I took my wife to the local supermarket. Like it's not far away, but there's a piece of trim on the car that's come unstuck, so I needed to glue it. Sure. And she went. She went into the shop, and I was sitting, and I thought I'll just do this. So I got out of the car and I was fiddling with this thing, and then I done it and then i got back in the car and i thought to myself that might be the first time in many years that i've actually concentrated on doing something outside the house and not been thinking about how i'm feeling really it was really weird i was like 100 percent just focused on what i was doing yeah and there was no thought of anxiety or god i'm standing outside the car feeling weird it was real weird so it was just automatic it was nice yeah it was just nice because yeah. the, the the only thoughts that i had was this better bloody stick <laughs> that's all I could think. <laughs> yeah, but like, I am fixing this. That's what a you know a normal so called normal person would yeah, yeah. do. Yeah, right? Because it's... I always, I often think to myself like if my miss we're sitting and have a chat me and my missus and I'm like what what do you actually think about? Because I find it hard to believe that people can just do stuff yeah. without having thoughts and that's like people do. They walk around the supermarket and they're not really thinking about anything. No. And like I can't remember what that feels like. No way. It feels good. <laughs> yeah, I'll tell you, the, fir the first time I remember that happening to me, <clears throat> there were many – actually, I shouldn't say the first time. In, in the things that I went through, there were many times or several times that that happened when I was coming off the medication and dealing with that. I remember one night, you know, I had been to work and um, came home, ate dinner, you know, like with the family. We were just sitting playing with the dog. And I remember it, – it, maybe it was a minute or two. I don't remember. But it, I remember the thought popping into my head like – wow, I just spent two minutes just petting the dog. Mm -hmm. Like all mm -hmm. I cared about was like petting Lexi. I, I it didn't, I wasn't thinking about myself for yeah. two minutes. And it was such a revelation. Like, oh, I forgot what that was like to just like be on autopilot. Yeah, yeah. That's what it was like the other day. Because did, the, yeah. did that did that then make you sort of start questioning and then you'd tense up maybe? That was probably in the early stages. That was that was different because I was dealing with the, the readaptation or withdrawal after the medication. And yeah, there was really yeah. nothing I could do. I learned a tremendous amount of coping skills there. When I came to mm. the, the conclusion, and I still believe this, like the only thing that fixes that, if you're going through that right now, is time. There yeah. weren't any herbs. There was nothing to swallow. There was nothing to drink. There was nothing to do. I just It was just chemistry. So mm. my receptor sites had to upregulate again, and that's just the way that goes. And I learned a lot of coping skills. That was a horrific six or eight months. I would do it again today because yeah. of the things that I learned going through that when you couldn't stop it. There was no stopping it. So no mm. amount of relaxing or breathing or meditating or 
being brave and strong or whatever you want to call it would stop it. It would just keep coming at you. And I just learned yeah. to let it be. And just like, this is it's just going to be time. just going to be time. So mm. that episode to me was like a beacon. Like uh, if I could be normal for two minutes, you know, yeah, yeah. then, uh, you know, I can be normal again. It's not impossible. So I remember mm. thinking that. So every time I would have a breakthrough like that, I think, or realize that it, I wouldn't, I wouldn't think I wouldn't second guess it and start having those thoughts again, or yeah. it wouldn't trigger me. It would actually be, I would interpret it as a good sign. Like this is progress happening. A little celebration. Yeah. yeah. A little bit. Yeah. This is progress. Mm. And, I, and I would try and build on that. Like, Oh yeah. The day that I got in the car and, and just, Oh yeah, no problem. Like I remember getting to the point where my kids were smaller in elementary school, but I remember getting to the point where it's like, oh, yeah, I'll, I can just, I'll just drive them to school because I mm. spent so many mornings, so many mornings getting up when everybody was sleeping in the freezing cold, putting on my jacket and my hat and everything, getting in the car, just driving around, driving to the school. Mm. The school was literally like not even a mile from my house and I would have mm -hmm. to practice going there. And I remember thinking because I want to be able to drive my kids to school or pick yeah. them up. Isn't it strange though how you can sort of learn to do or back then you could learn to do certain things, yes. but if you had to drive in the other direction, maybe it was you have a complete yeah, whole yeah. different animal. Whole but then different animal. Exactly what we've been saying for weeks is the interpretation of yes. the feelings because you're probably where well, you are exactly the same physical person doing whatever it is. Right. It's yeah. just how you're interpreting That's whatever it. it is you're doing. Same guy, same mm. level of safety, same everything, same life, yeah. same everything. Just yeah. why is this street scarier than this street? It's it's mm. not. It's only I think it is. Yeah, yeah. And I will also tell you that even – so that building that I used to have a problem going to where my business was, and we moved out of that building years ago, probably four years ago now. Mm. And even then, so when I was you know at that point living a pretty normal life, even four years ago, I, I was out of that building, but going to that building even to that day mm -hmm. was still, there was always that undercurrent. And I think it's just our brains are, that is survival. And I do believe in a way there's a lot of survival instinct in that. Yeah. When you perceive danger, your brain is really good at trying to steer you around that. Mm, and to mm. the day I moved out of that building, there was always a slight undercurrent of anxiety in that building. And even yeah. after moving out of that building, I would probably say it's only in the last year or so that if I drive the same path, I do not get that twinge anymore. Even yeah. even two years after being out of the building, if I mm. drove near it, past it, toward it like I used to, I would – and I know the turn. I would hit one spot where this was the point of no return. When I would be out in my doing my practice, I'm yeah. going to go to the end of this block where the diner is. If I make this right turn, I am committed. Because I'd be on a yeah, big yeah. road, I couldn't turn around. Yeah, that turn would give me that just a little twinge every time I did it for years. Mm -hmm. So, people also ask me like, "Oh, you're cured?" Well, and I've said this before on the podcast, like, no, mm -hmm. not necessarily cured, just because it's still there, and if I'm not careful, yeah. it can you know, it can come back. But mm -hmm. if that helps, it's not like, "Oh, this is a that's it. I never think about this again." Mm -hmm. Some things get ingrained deeply. They do, yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's it. It's that memory association. Yeah, yeah. So I don't know. That's. I mean, I could I could sit and talk about every symptom that I had, but that's. Yeah, yeah. I I, I probably had them all. <laughs> we'll save that for another episode. Yeah, I probably had them all. I mean, there were some things that I didn't get. I I'm sure we don't get every symptom, but I you know for me it was there was it was several times where there was a huge struggle. Mm. So I will say I will assert that there's probably nobody listening to us right now. That was any worse than I was. Yeah. And that you have it. been and that any of us have been. Mm. And I will offer this bit of advice and I tell people this all the time. Stop judging your anxiety as worse. Like, oh, you must. I'm worse than that than you. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I have it. You didn't have it like this or whoever, whether you're talking to me or anybody else. It's not. Nobody has it any worse. Anxiety well, is anxiety. Because I mean, people just see they see you standing there. They see me sitting here and we both look absolutely fine right <laughs> but i can assure you <laughs> but it's like in the past when i've been when i have been out and stuff and like i'll say i'm feeling really weird and my missus will say well you just look absolutely normal right like you don't look any and i'm questioning like am i have i gone pale you know yeah am i sweating do i look weird am i shaking nope you look exactly as you did if you didn't you say anything on the to couch. her yeah 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 exactly. she probably wouldn't have even known mm. Yeah, I've had that situation. Like, hey, you know, and I've said that several times in the past few years. Like, 
just sitting there with something like, well, right now I'm having a swing and panic attack right now. Like you yeah, are yeah. <laughs> like, mm. you really? You are. Yeah. So you're right. Who, who would know? Like nobody would even know. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. So you got to <laughs> stop judging it as I uh, exchanged messages the other day with somebody and, you know, kept talking about this horrific, how horrible it was. Horrible experience. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Mm-hmm. And you know what? I, I've used those words in this episode just now. Horrific, horrible, crushing. Mm-hmm. I've used all those negative adjectives, but in a way you have to, for me, one of the big turning points was I'm going to stop judging this as being anything. Mm. Like, I'm not going to deny it's bad. Nobody wants to feel this way, but I'm not going to keep calling it horrible. It just is. And yeah. like, my heart isn't racing any differently than your heart would race or anybody's heart would race. Mm-hmm. And I didn't breathe mm-hmm. any heavier than anybody else. And I didn't, you can't get any dizzier. You're either dizzy or you're not dizzy. It's sort of a binary thing. So yeah. I don't know. That was it's a big lesson. That's it. So that's it. I, that's That's my rambling. I've completely monopolized the airwaves here. Can I talk now? <laughs> sure, you can talk. I'm being very rude. <laughs> uh, <dear>. Yes, <laughs> I have noticed. <laughs> so, for anybody that's wondering, there was a comment on episode 16 that said it's their first time tuning in, and the guy on the right seems a little rude. So, I'm not 100% sure if they meant my right, which is yeah. him. Or my, their right, my right. Or, he, or their mean? right, so yeah. I believe when, when you're watching these videos, I believe you are on the right. I'm not saying you're rude or anything. I am on the right, and that's what I've been stressing about this all week. I've just told Drew before we started, <laughs> like, the guy on the right seems a little rude, but I thought I was the good boy. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I know. You're the I'm, feather I'm ruffler. The feather ruffler. ruffling Neanderthal from New York. Yeah. Well, he's the well-mannered lad from the UK. Come on. This is it. <clears throat> if anybody's rude, it damn it, I'm rude. <laughs> <laughs> it's my gift. Yeah, come on. <laughs> so what do we want to do? You want to take any questions? I was just looking at the questions that we had. We had a few on episode 16. Which I haven't even posted uh, yet. I oh, know, yeah. What is with that? Uh, come on. I've been so busy. I'll post Falling it. Falling behind. I know. Um... There was one question about, I think we were going to save this for a separate podcast, but it was wondering if we could touch on how we can stay positive in the face of family members or friends that are not understanding, or perhaps judgmental, Yeah. when anxiety, panic disorder, and agoraphobia takes over a person's life. It's an interesting topic, and, it's, and this person has lost many people in life because of extreme anxiety and it can be quite disheartening. Sure. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much the same. I don't really class myself as having any real friends, like not in person that yeah. I could talk to other than via the internet, yeah. which is pretty sad. You know, I used to have a lot of friends, but I guess they used to invite me out and stuff. And then I'd say no, whether right. it was be- if I was honest and said no because of anxiety they probably wouldn't have understood anyway. But I'd probably usually just make up some excuse. And then I guess people just get bored of asking. Well, it's like when my missus don't ask me if I want to go in the supermarket anymore. It's pretty much exactly the same thing. Yeah, you're probably right. I, I think mm. – and, and that's worthy of its own episode. That was a good comment. Yeah, yeah. We'll do one like that. And then we had one a couple of weeks ago from somebody who said uh, – you know, maybe we could talk about not that but we talked about this. Like, maybe you could do a vi- we could do a video for people who are with people like you and me. Like, what yeah, do you do with yeah. someone? But they're probably not mm. watching. So, yeah, <laughs> but, exactly. Uh, yeah, I think it's a good topic. I think just to quickly touch on it, my gut tells me that when you lose people in your life because of these situations, it's probably it's probably a combination. You know, like mm. we, I know I would isolate myself just out of, yeah, same. Out of fear. And then people don't understand or they don't want to be around that. So it's a little bit of both. It's not that people and, – and I've heard this before. Like, oh, everybody abandoned me or no one cares or no one understands so they leave me. Mm. It's probably not all that. It's probably a little of both. There's a yeah, little, yeah, you know, I would say. You know, I always just found it easier. Perhaps it, it's easier for me to not have to explain and sure. to not have to go to the pub for a sure. Swifty. You know, it's just easier. It's more comfortable to not. Of course. Of course, That's the problem. Is. Yeah, but yeah, we'll talk about that. It's good because it's just that out of interest. How did your wife deal with your anxiety back then? Like, if you were <clears throat> maybe if you let's just example, you're panicking in the supermarket sure. and you're with your wife. What's the response? Um. Okay. Here's probably the best way I can answer that question. I mean, I didn't hide it from her. You know, I, I wouldn't hide it from her. I would try to hide it from my kids because they were small, but. Mm. Um, 
I wouldn't hide it from her. And I think, first of all, she deserves a medal, <laughs> for sure, for going through that with me multiple times. Yeah, yeah. And second of all, she, I think, would think, what can I do here, but saw that there was not a whole lot that she could do. And she, to her credit, would just give me the space to handle it the way I needed to handle it, in a way. Yeah. So yeah. what was my wife's reaction? I think she tried not to react. Mm. I, I will give her credit for following my lead a little bit. I never, this is just the way I'm wired. I do not want to be taken care of. I do not need to be coddled. I don't want your sympathy. But I've always yeah. been like that. It's just part of my nature. So I mm. would, I would, I leaned on her in a big way. In my worst mm. time, she was my safe person. And, and she would just quietly fulfill that position without, I think, yeah. coddling me because she knew I didn't want to be coddled. So mm. Mm. her reaction often was no reaction. Like, I know yeah. you have this covered. If you need my help, you'll ask for it. And that's kind of how that went, mm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. There were times, though, when, uh, you know, I was in the car and freaking out, um, and I would call her. I was on the, I've been on the phone with her at 2 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. Because I was out working or putting, you know, putting out a fire or something like that and in a complete panic, you know, in the car mm -hmm. on the way back, not sure if I was going to make it back and I would wake her up and she would, she would talk to me. So I have done that. Yeah. The things that I always say not to do, I've done them. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, you know. He's uh, human. <laughs> Jeez, I, have done, I have done them, yes. So, but the people, oh, you know, close to me in my life, I think I didn't try to hide it from them, but I also. I feel like I didn't lean on them a whole lot because I'm just not, yeah, yeah. not generally that person anyway. Mm. Which I'm I not saying like, it's, it's bad. And that, uh, that's just the way I am. It doesn't make me right. Yeah, I, I feel like a, sort of my missus can't do right for doing wrong when they try and help. It's like. It's hard. It's really hard for them to. It's because the, number one, they don't understand. So if they try and help you, like, right. come on, you can make it. It's like, no, I fucking can't. You know? I but then know. if they don't try and egg you on you like you don't care it's a really they're in such a difficult position it is a topic for a whole freaking podcast man it is and, and and i don't know if it's you know because you know odds are your wife she wouldn't need to watch us so people yeah, who are yeah, with exactly. people like us wouldn't be looking for the podcast but i think for yeah. me i would love to talk about it just because of the acknowledgement of what our role is in that in a way mm, mm. you know so I, yeah, yeah. I, I never like I, how, how should we expect other people to exactly exactly yeah, yeah. and i would have to say that i think I, I had a little bit of a leg up because of the stupid isolationist way like pig-headed stubborn way that i am like <laughs> i'm going to do it myself i've always been that way like i don't need you i'm yeah, going to yeah. do it myself mm. In a way, it helped because it, I think it took some of the burden. I mean, it was burden. I, I freely admit that I put a burden on the household and the people yeah. close to me. But And they were concerned about me. My mother, I know, very concerned about me. I might lean on her a little bit more back in those mm -hmm. days. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, didn't, I didn't expect anything from them, and that helped, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, I don't expect you to do anything. I know you can't fix this or save me, so... I don't know if that matters at all. I never expected anybody to understand. I don't care if you didn't have to understand. Yeah, that yeah, helps. That's it. you've said that. Yeah, yeah, you don't have to understand. There's, it's okay. There's another part to that question. Um, sure. Just commenting on how to stay connected with people while being housebound. Any tips there? I guess, so. unfortunately, social media. <laughs> I know. Oh, we're doing it right now. I mean, you know, oh dear, we're a six-hour flight apart and communicating. Yeah. So. Mm. I think it's a double-edged sword. It's it's sword. I, pro I actually pronounced the W. What the hell? Sword. What's sword? What's up with that? <laughs> so uh, I think it's a double-edged sword because it's cool that we have this technology now, so you can communicate with people. Yeah. It's but bad. the problem is it's bad. You don't go and communicate with them. Exactly. Yeah. And but it's also bad because it can be a crutch. Like, yeah, I, I don't need to go out to the pub to see my my real life friends because I can just get on the internet. Mm, so mm. in a way, mm, the technology is awesome, but it's also a bit of an enabler, I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would agree. Yeah. So, I don't know. It's a good question. We'll talk about that for sure. Uh, Somebody commented and said that they do watch the whole video, because we always say at the end, <laughs> if you've got this far. We're at 44 minutes. I, gotta, I will give cr full credit to anybody who made it to this point in this video just watching me ramble yes. for the better part of 30 minutes. Just, Somebody said uh, they always get anxiety at its worst at 8 p.m. And they think about certain foods that they eat because it's going to make their acid reflux come. Hmm. And they'll panic from eating this or that. And we spoke about this before we went live. But I said that I 
have struggled terribly with acid reflux and indigestion for it's been a couple of years man certain yeah. foods that i eat if i eat them say after 6 p.m or something then yeah. i get it but i have noticed and whether it's anything to do with it that's i've been off the caffeine now for are we is it three weeks it's two or three weeks it's been a while and i and it has i haven't experienced it and i even had a little plug here for domino's pizza and that is a hundred percent acid reflux after eating Domino's, and I had it last weekend, and I didn't get it. Wow. So, read into that what you will, whether it's anything to do with caffeine. I don't know how or why it would. Could be. But, yeah. I so think it, especially if, if health anxiety is an issue, like anything that makes your body feel differently. Yeah, yeah. You know, the heartburn, the acid reflux, which is it's no fun. Um, yeah, yeah. Drop the caffeine. Drop the caffeine is never a bad idea. It's really hard because I know many people are just literally physically dependent upon it. Yeah, that's my uh, <laughs> lifestyle choice for the week. There was something <laughs> I, we spoke about before I was talking about. So it's a, a UK thing, but the NHS are trialing this thing where they're refusing minor surgery to anybody that is, maybe not anybody, but most people that are overweight or that smoke hmm. and make unhealthy lifestyle choices. So not major surgery if they're, leg falls off they're going to fix it <laughs> but anyway i don't know like ingrowing toenails stuff like that maybe yeah they're refusing to do the surgery until they start to look after themselves and it got me thinking about like you know when we go to the gp and the first thing we're offered is medication or maybe the talking therapy it might be a, a good suggestion for gps if there's any <laughs> any watching i very much doubt it but why not you know suggest to people look we're not going to give you this diazepam we're not going to send you for cbt until you get some exercise at least for a month you know try stop smoking yeah let's start eating healthily you know make those lifestyle choices and see because that might be all it takes what's your thoughts my thoughts on that i i think it's not a bad idea and i think um i don't know if i would go so far as to say we're not going to send you for cbt or mm. or help you until you get on the treadmill because that's a tough one. Um, I think to me that sort of hints at that, like you can fix your anxiety with your diet or exercise. Yeah, yeah. Those are things that can contribute to in to improving the situation. But I, I don't know how responsible it would be for a doctor to say, I'm not going to do anything until you exercise for a month. But, <laughs> yeah. but that being said, I think it's smart for the doctor to make you an active participant in your recovery. Yeah, right, yeah. wherever possible. Like if your leg falls off, well, you can't do anything about that. They have to fix it. But um, I remember mm. when my leg fell off. That was that was tough. But yeah, uh, that was a big deal. <laughs> remember, <laughs> that, yeah. was, that was difficult. But it was very messy. But I, yeah. I think yeah. there's nothing wrong with being being an active participant. Like part of this process is maybe we're going to give you some medication. We're going to send you to see this therapist, and you also have to do these things. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's not a bad you know, thing. Perhaps, perhaps instead of medication being the first, because that in the UK, that's the first thing it is you hear it so often. You it will go to too. the doctors, here's some pills, Yeah, come and see me and, you know, well, no, let's get it right. Here's some pills. You're going to feel worse within the first couple of weeks. Yeah. Nobody wants to hear that. No. What about going in and saying, okay, go home, exercise, eat healthily. Let's see if you feel worse within two weeks because you're pretty much guaranteed to feel better after two weeks of making those choices yeah rather than having the medication and we're talking we're not talking about medication for psychosis and schizophrenia and that right. we're talking about anxiety here sure yeah I, I think that's my thought yeah and it's not a bad thought we don't entirely disagree i think it's how the approach would be it's the changing the approach and what that symbolizes mm -hmm. i think i could definitely get behind like yeah, a yeah. little more explanation like this feels horrible but you know what's wrong with the doctor saying I know this feels really horrible and scary, but I assure you it is not going to kill you. So let's yeah, try yeah. this. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. I'm going to give you these pills, this benzodiazepine, you know, mm -hmm. try doing these things. Take one if you think you need to. Yeah, I, I would get behind that 100 percent as opposed to I'm going to write you a prescription. Here's 90 Xanax. Yeah, just take them three times a day. And I'll see you in two months for Enjoy. a refill. Uh, that I cannot yeah. get behind that plan. I'm sorry. I just can't. Mm -hmm. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of ways that we could change this and make it better. They're here. We're medicating first also. Does it come down to finance at the end of the day? There's uh, more money in medication than there is in uh, selling exercise bikes. If I am GlaxoSmithKline, 
Sure. I don't want to I don't want to hear like I'm not going to give you a prescription. I want that guy. I want that pad on fire, man. I want, yeah, I, yeah. I Isn't pharmaceuticals doctor. like the oh. biggest industry? One of the biggest industries in the world financially. It right? is. The pharmaceutical it companies is. are large. They spend tremendous amounts of money on lobbying here yeah. in the U.S., which I'm sure they do in any place where they get an influence in the vote. Mm. I, I don't want to make it turn this into a pharmaceutical conspiracy theory Come on. thing, but we'll do one of those. <laughs> yes. But sure, uh, drug companies are in business. They are businesses. I own a business. I'm here to make money. That is mm. I, I, unapologetic about that. My business is designed to make a profit. Yeah. Theirs is too, so I don't take that away from them. But you know, at what point? My dog died. It felt horrible. Handing me you know, 60, yeah. 60 days worth of Prozac is is bullshit in plain English. Pardon my French, but like mm. I should be sad the dog died. Like, welcome yeah. to the human race, brother. I'm not saying that all of it is like that, but we are so heavily over medicated in the US. Uh, don't get me started. <laughs> it's like we've spoke about before when like the I suppose the, the best thing for us to come from doing these videos is that nobody watches them because everybody's <laughs> got out there, yes. done their stuff, you know. Yeah. Whereas you see the programs and that that are on the net for sale will help you with your anxiety. They need to make the money to keep their business going. So they want more people to be suffering, essentially, really. They thrive off people that are suffering from it. Whereas for us, yeah. we don't want we want to get to a point where we have zero viewers because <laughs> we're getting zero ad revenue. Yes, yeah. You swines. <laughs> but that's the point, isn't it? <laughs> That is true. It's a really good point. And we're off on a tangent a little bit. We're at 51 minutes. But That's yes, wrong. it's true. If your product is medication, you need people who have reasons to take it. So yeah. it's not surprising that and, and you know, I don't want to get too far into this, but a huge pet peeve of mine. We're in it. Fuck it. Well, we're going sorry. Down you could bleep hole. that one. <laughs> um, we are going down a rabbit hole here in the US. Oh. It's less now because Cooler heads are starting to prevail, but I could not. When I was at my worst coming off my medication, my doctor, mm. who I will stand by to this day, he stuck with me. He gave me the line that he got from the pharmaceutical companies, which is there is no such thing as withdrawal. This is your original problem coming back. You need to get back right. on the medication. And I basically told him, you can stick a knife in my heart before I take another one of those pills. And mm -hmm. he said, okay, we'll do it your way. And I would go see him twice a week because he was very concerned about me. Yeah. And I could not walk into that office and sit in that waiting room without seeing a very attractive young lady in a short skirt with with food, free lunch, and, yeah. and samples of some drug or another, all pervasive, all the time. And the pharmaceutical companies have had a stranglehold or a very large influence on the way medicine was practiced in the U.S. I don't know if it's the same in the U.K., but it we, was we an lunch. issue. Oh, you could I'm not sure go to that. a doctor's office. Not for us. The lunch wasn't for me. The lunch was for the doctor and his staff. Oh, I was going to say. No, it was influence peddling in a big way. We're going to keep every day. There was another <laughs> spread in my doctor's office. <laughs> you look and you it's getting like, sandwiches. I'm freaking and... starving, man. How about, I'll take one of those. <laughs> and they would bring every day was a free lunch from some. And I could not sit there for 20 minutes waiting in the waiting room without having one or two pharmaceutical reps walk in the door with their samples, with some sort of gift and like. Yeah. Can I see the doctor? And they would be like, well, he's really busy right now. Well, can you tell him so-and-so is here? And they were, this is the way we did it. I don't see that anymore here. So it is changing to a certain extent. The only thing we get at the doctors here is like six-month out-of-date magazines on a table. <laughs> That's it. Beat them and weep. Hey, look, it's a review of the 1987 Camaro. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. It's covered in like spittle that people have been coughing out. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's, nice. that's bleak. That is very bleak. <laughs> and it's yeah. it's foggy and cloudy because it's oh, England. It's yes. Beautiful. <laughs> so, beautiful. Anyway. Let me have a look. We've got sure, something else. Sure. There was some, something uh, Johnny Q, he posted about, because I was mentioning different scents and sounds and foods, and he was saying that pizza, he ate pizza once, had pa like three panic attacks the day after, and then yep. stayed off pizza, which pizza. is completely irrational, but that's... The kind of stuff that we're talking about, isn't it? He yeah. does now eat pizza, by the way. Good job, Johnny. Well done, man. I want pizza right now. Domino's. Oh. That's bad for you. That's Unless bad you for don't me. have caffeine, then you'll be all right. Then you're okay. The lack of caffeine yeah, shields yeah. you from the negative effects of the pizza. But, but I don't know if you remember uh, Paula from Panic Station Days. She lived in the UK. Paula. 
A little bit. I remember the name. She, she commented on the last video just saying, wow, I've just realized who Drew is. She remembers you from no Panic kidding. Station. No I'll have to look at days. that. Yeah, I'll have to look. And she, she's now doing exposure, so she's like, I would say she's probably worse off than myself. She's really, really struggled with stuff, but she has a, a health visitor that goes in and like sets her different tasks and stuff, so she's working really hard as well. I just thought we should... Uh, yeah. Say hello to Paula. I know she watches the stuff and like so I've had a back and forth with her before. Yeah. She didn't live too far away from me. Oh. Very so cool. So it'd be cool. But I, I don't know if I've ever mentioned or like recently I set up a Facebook group just for the local area. I think that there's only like fifty members in it and I posted in there the other day just saying about a local meter. Yeah. You know, nothing not like a big extravagant thing. Right. With loads of people there, just like three or four of us maybe <laughs> meeting on the side of a road just to say hi. That yeah. was where I was thinking. But that's the sort of thing that I'm trying to – just to get out there. Whether I need to meet other people that are suffering as well, I don't know. I just need to meet people. Hey, it's that's not my a, thing. It's not a yeah. bad place to start. And you that's know what? what I think. N- knowing you as I do, it, it, you know, those groups are awesome. They could quickly become like – Let's all commiserate together, or they can yeah, become. Yeah, let's yeah. cheer each other on, and yeah, that's what I'd, I'd love to find that that we used to have. I feel like I need that. Yeah. Again, like, and I've said so many on so many of my videos. Like, if you do anything like this, please share a link yeah. to the video. But nobody seems to do it. But there are people out there that do it. I just, I don't know. I don't know. Positivity goes a long way. It doesn't cure everything. I'm not, I'm not that guy. Mm. But mm. there's so. And there's a therapeutic value in that. When you try and do something, when you try and inspire and cheer other people on, it tends to impact. It did for me. Yeah, like, exactly. You know, that night that you were watching Chris and then you got that call. There you go. That was the reason that you gave it a go. Yes. He, he absolutely, it was inspiring. Like, this guy's doing it. I could do that. Like, yeah, yeah. I want to do that too. So, yeah. Yeah, it's good stuff, man. So if you are doing exposure therapy, yes. share the bloody link. Share the comment. Yes, yes, absolutely. We'd love it on either channel for sure. I'll or even maybe people want to start doing it and they don't know where to start. Just share a comment. Let's try and build maybe some kind of community. We can bounce it off the the Facebook forum group that you've put together. Yeah, sure. If anybody that's in the podcast, if if they want to do it on Facebook or wherever they want to do it, there's always Doesn't matter. Yeah. If they want to do it privately, whatever. Yeah. Even if you want to just do it yourself and just tell us about how it went. Privately is uh, well, we're we're almost an hour into it, but for those diehards that are still hanging in there, <clears throat> I, I got to throw this out there. I have I have received in the last two weeks uh, more than I ever have messages that are always awesome, and I love the feedback, and I'm glad we're helping. Are they about how rude the guy is on the right? Very much. They are so upset by this. <laughs> <laughs> the guy with the funny accent. And then we'll figure out who that is, but um, could be me. Forget about it. <laughs> so, but I have received more messages in the last two or three weeks than I ever have asking if I will have private conversations, Skype, yeah. phone, whatever. This is not that I don't want to do that. Uh, the issue that I have is two. Number one, I only have so many hours in a day. <clears throat> so I'm happy to answer questions any way I can. I would like it if your questions can benefit everybody so you ask a question and we can answer it you know on the podcast or or in a public forum that would be awesome i will answer private messages i have no problem with that but i I only have so many hours in a day i don't do this for a living and i am not a a therapist i'm not a licensed credential i do not have a phd in psychology so he's reading all this from a teleprompter it is it's up there you know so as much as i i like to help and i'm 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 willing to put the time in i don't have enough time to do that sort of thing I don't mind you asking. It's not offending me in any way, but I'm not qualified to do therapy over the internet or otherwise. And I, I would, it just doesn't, it's not right for me to do that. I can help not, point you to somebody who maybe can. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not that, not that there is any, is there recognized qualifications for it? I guess there is for therapy. But oh, there not absolutely for, is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah sorry. Yeah. Where, where I live for sure. I was you, thinking mindfulness and all that kind of junk. Yeah, there's a ton of people. Although, you know what? On the flip side, I've seen many people on social media call themselves anxiety coaches. I, they don't, I don't believe they have any particular qualifications. I, I actually have a diploma in mindfulness. Nice. I, I'm, allow, I'm allowed to use letters after my name. Really? I, yeah, if I but I have to pay. I have to. I think I have to pay like thirty quid, and I can have certain letters after my name. Wow, nice. Which is interesting. I have letters after my name. Usually they're S O B. I was going to say N O B. 
yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, you know, they're out there. Anxiety coaches online. Whatever you I, want. I don't know if what that is or not. I just don't feel yeah, comfortable. Yeah, that's it. I mean, yeah. I, I have a diploma in mindfulness, and I really don't know what I'm talking about. So that's so how that, easy uh, it is to get one. Sure, that's sure. The point. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out there <clears throat> for anybody okay. who's still watching. So should we wrap this up? If anybody wants mindfulness sessions, they're fifty pound per hour. There you go. There you go. Or send one large Domino's pizza to yes, tandoori.com. <laughs> That's it. We're, I'm out of questions. All right, I'm out of answers. That's it then. So we hope you can relate to. Uh, yeah, yeah. That was the point. It wasn't horribly the point boring. was to share Drew's experience. That was the whole point of this podcast: is so people can actually see that he's been there. Yeah, he knows what it feels like, and that's why he's talking from experience. So. Been there, done that. Exactly. All right, peeps. Thanks for tuning in as always. Episode 17 in the in, bag. In the can. We will. I will upload 16 now. Billy's two days ahead of me. I'll throw that up there, and I, I try not to fall behind. I'm always on schedule. But as always, thatanxietyguy.com or on YouTube, it's always that anxiety guy wherever you go. Facebook, and Twitter, And it's the YouTube, same with us, Anxiety, anxiety United, Absolutely. wherever you look. So comments, questions, videos, sharing, whatever you want, it's it's the best. Yeah, so. get the comments in. Get the questions in. I, I love doing this part at the end. It's yeah, it's cool. Good. Very cool. That's it. All right, dude. Hopefully my audio is good on this one. Apologies for the last episode. We're yeah, working on it. Yeah. I need, need some new setup. So. All right. It. See you guys We're next out. time.